Hey folks, welcome to my fireside chat tonight, if you can remember the fireside chats of history. Now that's not what that this is, but I am broadcasting from home this evening and uh, I thought I'd try it from this spot, we'll see how it works. Plus it sort of serves as a bit of a illustration of the the... the lesson we'll be looking at from James chapter 3 uh, and its topic, at least one of the illustrations of that topic. So I'm uh, glad you're able to tune in and hope the study is a benefit to you um, as we look at it. So a um, little story to begin. Um, it was reported uh, that on a windy day in March 1997, there was a father and his son that came to, to Valley Forge National Historical Park, the place where George Washington uh, uh, stationed the Revolutionary Army uh, during the winter of 1777 and 1778, I believe, um, that difficult winter of the Revolution. And this father and son... Um, you know, over 200 years later, um, came to this park and, and, th but they actually had something a, a bit less historic in mind. They wanted to launch a model rocket. And at first they tried, uh, using electric ignition wires to light the fuse, but didn't have any success with that. So they tried lighting the fuse with just a, a common sparkler. Uh, the, you know, the kind you play with on 4th of July, and that's where the trouble began. Um, the sparks from the sparkler ignited a grass fire, and the winds on that day quickly spread the blaze and burnt the field, uh, one entire field where the Revolutionary, Revolutionary War soldiers had trained and the the fire actually came within a half a mile of George Washington's headquarters. Um, it took 30 units of 12 fire departments to fight the blaze for an hour before they got it under control. And in the end, over 30 acres were charred as a result. Uh, the man who had the sparkler was charged with destruction of government property and illegal use of fireworks. All of that because of a, a little harmless sparkler. Um, you know, in our time, we hear so much about deadly weapons and the potential destruction they can cause. Um, and, and one way to think about what we're going to look at here tonight is that really each one of us has a deadly weapon, a potential deadly weapon. Um, the positive side of that is that the same thing can also be an extreme power for good. Uh, both of them are true. It all depends on who's in control of this thing that we have. And, and so we'll see here in a moment what James is talking about in James chapter three. But, uh, Maybe a little bit of poetry to begin. Just a little piece called Death or Life in Words. A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel wor word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate instill. A brutal word may harm and kill. A gracious word may soothe the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. So I'm sure you know what the uh, potential weapon of mass destruction uh, that we're talking about is, or on the other hand, uh, the possible instrument of so much good, depending on who controls it. Uh, what is that thing that we speak of? Well, uh, like the family doctor tells us, just say, ah, and stick it out, and you'll know what we're referring to, the tongue. Uh, it is powerful. That is unquestioned. 
and in what way it's powerful depends on who's in charge of it. So let's remember uh, and listen to what James has to say about this in his letter. We're up to uh, the third chapter of James uh, in our study this evening. We're just going to take a moment and read, I think it's the first 12 verses, to, to recall his wisdom on this. James 3, beginning at verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed, and has been tamed, by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring bring forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. A lot of images uh, in that teaching and in that reading from James. And, uh, you know, the way he starts it is sort of fascinating and maybe could be misunderstood, misapplied, where he says, not many of you should become teachers. Um, why would James, a Christian teacher, um, why would he say such a thing? And, you know, as, as, as a teacher myself and wanting to increase the number of teachers and that kind of thing, you know, that could be a troublesome uh, thing that people read in the Bible. Not many of you should become teachers. And I've heard people use it as an excuse not to teach. But maybe understanding a bit of where it comes from is, is helpful to us. You know, in the early church, teachers were very important. Um, most of the people in those early years were brand new Christians. You didn't have a lot of old, mature Christians. Uh, many of these people were, were still learning how to be disciples of Jesus, still learning many of the basics. So a teacher had great influence, and it would have been considered a, a position of some prominence, you know, maybe even a position of power in some people's minds. And with that came a, a great temptation to seek the position of teacher in the church with perhaps less than pure motives. Uh, some, some craved the power and influence over people that came with the role. And some loved the respect and praise that it perhaps brought. Some just loved the sound of their own voice and making others listen to it. And uh, maybe some of those things still occur today. James says, teachers, you have this weapon of mass destruction in your mouth as well. So be careful. Be careful with it. Make sure that the right person controls it. You know, the church 
from its beginning has always needed good teachers and we still desperately need them. Uh, the importance of the teacher's role in the kingdom it has not diminished over time. Um, but we all need this warning about being careful and, and taming our tongue. Uh, it's just something we, we need to hear from time to time. So James goes on from that in verse 2 by confessing sort of for all of us uh, the truth that we all struggle at times with contempt containing, controlling our tongue. We're all imperfect in this endeavor. And if anybody was able to perfectly control their tongue, they would indeed be perfect people, James says. And there just aren't any of those around. So we're obviously not saying that a person has to be perfect in order to teach or to be a good follower of Jesus um, again, that idea sometimes scares people off from ever trying to teach or, or you know, uh, doing the work to become a teacher. But uh, there are no perfect teachers, and um, there was just one, actually, and, and he taught a long time ago, the Lord Jesus. So uh, if you're one of those considering it, don't let that idea or James' words scare you off. Uh, it's certainly... Those words certainly weren't designed to do that. James, I'm convinced, has something much more blatant in mind than a mere mi mistake that a person might make when they're trying to teach or um, just misspeaking uh, on some occasion. I think he has a lot more uh, in mind than that. He's thinking of, of some who might... You know, as we described, sort of eagerly seize the opportunity to stand in front of God's people as teachers because they just love that position. They love the preeminence that it might bring. They love to control, perhaps. They love to spout their opinions and push their agenda. And they might even boast of knowledge that they don't have. Um, in short, they, they use their tongue as a weapon to strike out instead of uh, what it's supposed to be for. And they mislead and they intimidate and they injure with their tongue. And James underlines it very explicitly here. The tongue has incredible power, possibly for good, possibly for evil. And it sort of has power far out of proportion to its size. You know, it, you know the tongue is a small thing, and yet its power is great. It's like a little bit that's put in the mouth of a, a big horse's mouth, and yet it controls the horse. It's like the rudder of a ship. It's so minute in size compared to the ship, but the ship is useless without it. And it's like, again, a little fire that consumes an entire forest. Um... And so, as usual, James uh, is very blunt and plain-spoken in this passage. If you think about it, you know, if there was ever a, a scripture that was hellfire and brimstone in the, in the old language of preaching, uh, it's this one. Because he talks about hell, and he talks about fire. And he calls the tongue untamable. He calls it evil and, and poisonous. And, and one might think at first reading uh, that the passage is, is all negative. It's all doom and gloom and pessimism, but it really isn't as you read the entire thing. There's a gleam of hope that's tucked away in verse 4 in particular. Because in verse 4, James is developing the illustration of this great ship. It's being guided by a little piece, a little rudder. But notice what he says about it. He says, though they are so large and, and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Isn't it interesting? He writes this 2,000 years ago, and it's still true of ships today. But there's that key phrase, wherever the will of the pilot directs. 
See, there's someone that directs the rudder of the ship. And there's also someone who directs that little rudder that each of us has in our mouths called the tongue. If God has your tongue, there's no danger in being a teacher or anything else. Uh, if God has your tongue, it won't be a weapon of destruction, but instead you'll use it to bless God. You'll lose, use it to bless others. Good things, positive things. If, on the other hand, the devil's got your tongue, if he's the one who controls it, it will injure and hurt and destroy. Uh, it will burn down forests. It will sink ships. And the sad thing is that same tongue, um, that, that same tongue that can sing songs of praise and, and blessing one minute, in the next minute, it can curse a brother or a sister. James says, from the same mouth, verse 10, come blessing and cursing. And he says, this ought not to be so. People will justify it, though. You know, uh, I've heard people say, oh, I, I've always just spoke my mind. Uh, if I know something, I tell it. Or they'll blame it on the other person. They had it coming. Scripture, though, answers those weak excuses and justifications with those questions that are posed in verses 11 and 12 of our text. The question is, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Well, the answer is obviously no. And then he asks, can a fig tree, brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? The answer to those questions, of course, is a resounding no. So, if you really want to be a good disciple, a faithful follower of Christ, there's no better place to start than, than with your tongue. Start there because it controls nearly everything else you do. Uh, realize that the issue here is not being perfect. It's not as if you're never going to make, make a mistake, say something wrong, say the wrong thing, um, say something in the wrong way. The issue isn't perfection. The issue is who controls your tongue. Is it the God who created it? Or is it the enemy who would corrupt it and would use it for his own purposes to hurt and potentially destroy. Who's got your tongue is really the question that James is working on in this passage and that, that should be working on us as we consider it together. So a good reminder from this, this wonderful chapter of, of James' letter. Um, let's have a word of prayer together before we close. Holy Father, thank you for the day and pray you continue to watch over us and we praise your name, and we want to do your will and see many others come to know you. Show us how we fit into your kingdom and what you're trying to do on this earth. And help us to realize the power of the tongue you've given us and that, that we will use it um, under your control. Thank you for giving us time to be together, even in this remote way. And may it be a blessing to our lives to, to gain wisdom from your word. And we pray this through and in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Y'all have a great week.